So I think next on deck. Thank you very much, Vic. That was uh, another <laughs> another world class presentation, I must say. Uh, Thank you. And uh, clearly, uh, to me, uh, these are two of the best minds we have in technology commercialization going into real uh, venture finance and worldwide application of their research and technology. Congratulations both Carlito and Vic, if I must uh, say so. Uh, uh, what we'll do now is uh, we'll uh, again delay the Q&A for later, but I hope it piqued your interest. To me, I learned again that there was a botanical park pathway. I didn't realize that. I have not recommended that to any of our Tuklas Lunas in the audience, but now you know. So maybe we can pursue that scientist of uh, the Toklas Lunas uh, research, uh, including Anne Villalobos, who of course is uh, very much helping uh, Bukidnon at CMU. So we'll talk about that on the side. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we'll have to move on to our next speaker. Uh, this is uh, another foreign speaker. Uh, this is the uh, luxury of having Zoom now. We can get speakers from all over the world. So, uh, Homer Pantua is based in San Francisco in Genentech, but the unique thing with Homer is he is a co-founder of a company here in Batangas, and he will be talking about that uh, today as part of his R&D commercialization and technopreneurship. So I think without much uh, more uh, description about uh, his background, uh, I'll let him, uh, he's going to be in another session later on anyway. So you can check out his CV elsewhere, but I'll let him have the floor now. Thank you, Homer. Ming salamat din sa yo, Homer. <laughs> That's a good Thank presentation. You. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you quick. for a very uh, well uh, assembled jigsaw puzzle there. Uh, <laughs> clearly, uh, you got your uh, targets and goals uh, all arranged up. And, uh, yeah. So we have heard three excellent speakers so far talking about how to digest baby's milk and how to start a company behind that to become a hundred million dollar venture. You have spirulina stress extracts that is addressing a worldwide market starting from your nails and your toes. Now we have Homer who's presenting your applications towards the veterinary animal and uh, clearly a big issue now on African swine flu and Are you still live? Can. Yeah, I know I see Sir Al. No. I think we kind of lost uh, Al. Um, all right. So <laughs> he spoke with me earlier anyway. So I think that in his absence, uh, we should proceed. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to. Look at the program here. Uh, okay, does anybody have the program? Yeah, I think I'm next. All right, so uh, I understand you're Isagani, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, all right. <laughs> so our next speaker is Isagani Padolina. I know you're with a company, and tell me again your company, please. It's Pascual, Pascual Pharma Corporation. Pascual Pharma Corporation, yes. So without further ado, please, uh, Isagani, uh, the yes. floor is yours. Thank yes. you. Yes. I'm going to start sharing. Can you guys see the slide? Uh, yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Start the slideshow. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah? Yes, you're all set. Yes. You can proceed. Good morning. Good morning. Good evening to uh, good morning to the people here in the Philippines and um, uh, good evening to um, our uh, 
participants also from the U.S. I just like to thank Paase briefly for uh, this uh, opportunity to um, fellowship with you guys today, and also for the brain horsepower that uh, Paase has. Um, we've we've uh, we've taken advantage of that a lot of times um, at Pascual Pharma, uh, just getting ideas and also. Uh, helping solve the problems that we have. So today I'm going to focus more on uh, the, past, the past three speakers uh, talked about um, uh, commercialization of uh, uh, products from the lab um, to market. Um, what I'm going to focus more on is um, kind of the, 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 the choices that we have to make after commercialization. So I'm going to talk more about the research and development, the continuing research and development that we've had to do um, after commercializing um, uh, uh, research that, that's based um, from the academe, right? So, so what I'm gonna focus on today is, uh, so I'm in the lab right now. Um, we're operating at 25% at the UPLB Science and Technology Park. Um, the, the RAs are sleeping here, so there's kinda, I just want to make sure that you don't see the beds that are on the floor. Everybody's just trying to wake up. Um, and so, so we're just, I, what I want to focus on is a project, you know, so I'll talk about the, the R and D commercial, that post commercialization efforts that we're doing. And I'll talk about in context of a, a project that's, that's funded by DOSD. Okay. So last year I had the opportunity to talk, talk at uh, the Paase meetings, the annual meetings in Manila. Um, and we talked about the critical elements of industry academe partnerships, you know, talking about three factors, leadership, talent, and institutional processes, right? So, so we talked about for leadership, you know, fostering a culture of competence and quality decision-making. For talent, we talked about design, design, and competence and also data integrity. And for the institutional processes, we talked about um, design as well, you know, like uh, designing experiments and also, and also the, uh, the processes involved in making sure tools are available for scientists to use, right? So today I'm gonna focus more on, you know, what are the challenges that we're facing, you know, especially if we have limited R&D talent and capacity. So we don't, we focus more on sharing instead of institutionalizing talent. You know what I mean? Like instead of hiring talent from the already limited um, uh, uh, resources that we have in the academe, we push our network out and, and take advantage of those brain horsepower while they're existing at the academe, right? The current challenge here in the Philippines is it's a generics driven business. We have a lot of established, it's an established products market, you know, so R&D is not really a priority when it comes to, to, to uh, pushing uh, sales here and marketing in the Philippines. You know, we focus more on sales and marketing efforts, right? So, so that's a, a big challenge too, um, in terms of the research culture in the industry, right? And the other challenge is speed to market through licensing and pre-registered pre drug products. So I'm also going to talk about the choices that we've had to make when we're choosing between products, you know, from, from, from technology transfer from the academe and also products that are also existing, you know, in other countries um, from other suppliers. Okay. So the project that I wanted to focus on today is our efforts to, to uh, improve and standardize one of our crown jewels, which is Relief Sambong. So Relief Sambong, Sambong is a, is a registered um, home remedy product. So basically, like what Vic was talking about, we have a, uh, uh, what we call a home remedy pathway here in the FDA for uh, extracts and uh, uh, natural product extracts. And so that, that's where Sambong is, uh, is, is registered into, right? So Sambong is a, is a product, you know, just, I'm just gonna introduce it briefly. Sambong is a product that was uh, developed by UP and DOSD and was commercialized by Pascual Pharma in the late 1990s. 
and it has grown into uh, uh, one of our biggest products. Um, it's for antiurolithiasis. It's a diuretic drug. It's uh, for dissolution of kidney stones. Um, it's it's ninety six percent of the market, including including the synthetic drugs. You know, so it's a very effective uh, uh, product. It's 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 demand is driven through prescription from the doctors, even though it's an OTC product, right? So the. The, the effort is really, when we standardize, we have two options. We either standardize it through a known compound or we standardize it to a clinically significant compound. So that's what we're trying to do is instead of picking just a, a marker, we want to pick a marker that's clinically significant, right? So part of the, there's three efforts going into that. One is developing the right bioassay, right, to, to make sure that we have the proper markers, you know, uh, we're, we're studying the proper markers. We also wanted to study the agronomy of the plant itself. So, so we wanted to see how the, so if you think about the plant, it's like a big organic chemistry lab, you know, it produces a bunch of these uh, compounds that are beneficial, right? Um, and the environment has a, there's a lot of environmental factors that play a role into how that profile is produced. So by collaborating with TIP, the Technological Institute of the Philippines, we're trying to look at those abiotic stressors um, to see how we can control, you know, for lack of a better term, the uh, profile that we want to extract, right? We're also looking at the post-harvest, um, the effect of post-harvest parameters, for example, the, uh, the ratio of polar and non-polar um, extraction parameters um, to see how we can further standardize that clinically significant profile, right? So what I'm gonna go through in the next couple of slides is just show you um, a proof of concept um, of this ongoing project um, that's funded by DOST. It's a cradle grant funded by DOST. So this shows you a profile of Sambong. You know, we have a project with Carlito Lebrilla, a separate project on a, on a, on, on a glycomics of, uh, of uh, lung cancer and using natural product extracts to, to see how those glycomic profiles are, are uh, influenced, right? And so a part, of the, a part of that is the help, the brain horsepower that we get from Carlito and his lab in also developing a method that allows us to look at the uh, different uh, compounds in some bone. Right, so this is a result of that. Just to, just to highlight some of the things that we've we've uh, some of the collaborative efforts that we've uh, we've experienced with Paase, with Paase members. So so from this profile, so we know what's there. We know the different. We have the standards. We have the isolated compounds. So the question is, is this clinically significant? Right. So that's the next question, and part of that is developing the the bioassay. And part of it is also controlling how that profile comes into play, right? So in our collaboration with TIP, with its engineers and data analysts, uh, data scientists, you know, so we're, this just kind of illustrates the neural network that we're trying to establish. Um, and it looks at the different metabolites. It, look at, it looks at, it interfaces with the results from the bioassays that we're looking at. And it also looks at the different environmental factors over here, such as soil pH, light intensity, temperature, soil chemistry, et cetera. And also looking at solvent polarity and drying temperature and extraction time. So hopefully when we get all that data, we can kind of predict, you know, the holy grail is, um, can we modify or predict, you know, the profile that we're getting, you know, from the plants, right? considering that it's very plastic. It's very plastic when the profile is produced. All right, so we've developed, so this is our first prototype. So we got, we, from that grant, we got a greenhouse in UP Los Baños um, in our lab at the UPLB Science and Technology Park. And you can kind of see the Sambong plants there and, and some of the wires coming in into the sensors and the light sensors, right? This is, uh, the global environmental sensor and the local environmental sensor for the spots. The global sensor is for the bigger 
bigger uh, uh, abiotic stressors like light, temperature, and, and relative humidity. Right? So, so after putting these sensors in, this is hooked up to, the, uh, to a server, and we started collecting data. I kind of want to show you where we're at. Right? Kind of exciting. So, so one of the issues we're having is, is internet connectivity and power outages. So UPLB still suffers from, from power outages. You know, we're not, we're, 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 we're still on the uh, old grid, you know, that we're trying to manage. And, and you can see here in this graph, just from the moisture sensor that we, we're, we're getting a lot of missing data. Um, um, in some aspects, there's more missing data than the others when you look at the different pots of, of plants, right? So what, what our data scientists from TIP did is look at this data. If you look at letter A, um, you can see kind of the missing data in May 10, after May 17, between May 17 and May 24, and between May 24 and May 31. So what they did is they, they used an algorithm to kind of impute um, and, and, and put in new data, right, to, to sort of uh, help us normalize uh, the things that we're seeing. And the, the algorithm that they use replicates the variability that we see in the data that we have collected. So kind of just a surrogate data, just so we can analyze, analyze the, uh, the, the the whole the, the the multiple points you know um, um and overcoming the missing data challenge so the next part is um trying to normalize that data right because you can see here in the x-axis for a we've got times 10 to the fourth right so we wanted to normalize it just between zero and one so with these the data scientists the tib kind of look it's kind of interesting is they used a uh, stock market um, data transformation um, algorithm, you know, called the Williams R. You know, it's, it's one of the algorithms in the stock market that they, they used to predict, you know, when you would buy and sell. And um, they use that to normalize this data. And you will see from the bottom, you know, in C and D, these are the, these are the images that the neural network sees when they look at the data, right? If you can see from A to C, you know, the, the, the contrast is, is not that good. So we couldn't look at the differences between the data points that we've collected. You know, the transformation to William, using Williams R uh, kind of help us get more contrast, as you can see in the images on letter D. You know, the contrast has improved. It allows the neural network to study and analyze the data better and learn from it. Right, so that's what we're trying to do. I kind of want to show you the result of that. You know, if we look at just a one-way street, so we're just we're not trying to to change uh, parameters yet, but we want to look at if it can predict um, chromatograms based on the data that it gets. So this is kind of this is the the the, the initial proof of concept that I want to show you guys. Um, and it, it, uh, the, the true chromatogram is at the top and the prediction chromatogram is at the bottom. You can see that there, it's pretty good. It's pretty good in terms of profile, but we still have a lot of challenges when it comes to quantitation of those peaks, right? So that's the challenge that we're looking at. And, and um, the TIP team was just here a couple of weeks ago so we can change the sensors, upgrade the sensors and upgrade the, uh, algorithms, you know, I'm going to show you in the next slide, you know, some of the upgrades that we got. So you can see at the bottom left, um, the old, um, the old setup that we have, we've got the new setup right here uh, with upgraded sensors, upgraded local sensors, upgraded global sensors, kind of see the uh, Coca-Cola um, modification that we've done to water, waterproof our power strips, right? Um, so hopefully with this better collection um, and better connection and a, a better generator uh, that, that we just, we just uh, was able, we were able to borrow from UPLB, we'll have a better, better data profile um, for, for, for predicting 
the chromatograms. So that's where we're at. I, um, part of the thing is, part, part of the big, big uh, effort right now is making sure we, we prepare for the next generation sambong. You know, which is, which is, um, you know, not just more efficacious, but, but the quality. We're trying to focus more on the quality to make sure that that uh, from from uh, from farming to manufacturing, uh, we're getting our quality systems in place. Right. So, that where we're at from an industry academic perspective, you can see here from the World Economic Forum rankings, we. The Philippines has improved, you know, from rank 61 to in the 20s um, because of the uh, efforts made by USAID Stride, by Paase, um, and also by the Balik scientists that are coming from, from, uh, from the US and other countries like Anne Villalobos, um, and also efforts by Homer, who's trying to establish um, collaborations with, with, uh, with with academe here and academe abroad, and also his own company here in uh, in uh, the Philippines, right? So we're kind of, that's kind of good. It's 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 looking better, you know. We're experiencing a lot of that too at Pascual Pharma, right? Our 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 dream is kind of we want to have a a better collaboration, not just between industry and academe, but within our industry itself. And that's kind of hard because we don't focus on R&D. We focus on sales and marketing. But we're, we've been working with Joey at Unilab to establish more informal alliances. And hopefully we can replicate what they've done here at Pistoia, alliance.org. It's an alliance, a pre-competitive and pre-commercialization alliance between different pharma companies uh, in the U.S. and in Europe, right? Right. So just to show you um, the challenge here in the Philippines, just to show you the market so you can see what I was talking about in terms of generics, right? So, so in, in 2018, the, the Philippine pharma market is about 220 billion pesos. And it's largely driven by generics. You can see ethical, which is prescription drugs and OTC. It's mostly prescription. You can see in the MNC at the right side, you know, the MNC and local mix, you know, that's uh, about 50-50. A lot of that is, is uh, dominated by Unilab. So a lot of the growth is really generics based. We are a generics based uh, uh, market. We're not, uh, we don't produce APIs here, our active pharmaceutical ingredients. And that's kind of where we want to go. And I hope the, the push for vaccine production because of COVID-19 kind of pushes our capacity that way. Um, um, so we're hoping for a, for a, 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 better, a better push in R&D in, in terms of producing our own API here. And we've got a good, we've got a good uh, uh, um, atmosphere or, or, or environment in terms of um, biodiversity, right? And that's our, our, our opportunity to produce our own AP, natural product-based APIs. Right? So this is, I'm on my second to my last slide, right? Um, in choosing products in a generics-driven market, when we're trying to choose between academe-based technology and, uh, and, uh, Kind of, how do I get back? Hold on, sorry, sorry about that. Okay, so we were talking about academe-based technology and industry product sourcing. That's from a business development side. That's kind of what we're trying to balance, right? Because if we're a, in a generics business, it's very easy to look at established products coming from established sources, right? Because in terms of quality and reliability, the GMP standards are there. In terms of cost, it's low cost. And we mostly talk about transfer pricing arrangements. Speed is pretty fast. It's six months, you know, unless they don't have stability data for our zone, right? For our tropical zone. And the projected five-year revenue is kind of known. We look at, these are our filters. We got to make 40 million pesos on the fifth year. If it doesn't do that, then we won't, we won't 
go into it. We won't spend resources into it. And when you look at academe-based technology, when it comes to quality and reliability, the validation is limited, right? Cost is pretty high. And this is the current cost that we're looking at from UP Tech Transfer, right? Which is um, 1 million pesos for licensing and 5% on gross sales, which is pretty big, right? You're not going to make, you know, aside from, aside from if you want to make money, you're going to definitely squeeze the farmers if you're doing botanical drugs and you're limiting um, access to the patients because you have to jack the prices up. Speed is still a challenge and the projected five-year revenue is unknown. So this is kind of the conversation that we're having also at, with the drug discovery program of DOST to try to um, get some of these uh, uh, considerations in play, especially when it comes to quality and reliability, cost and speed. Right. So hopefully I was able to talk about, you know, um, uh, the challenges that we're having, the choices that we have to make. Um, um, we're pretty good at pre-commercial uh, partnerships when it comes to industry and academia. Now. I'm really optimistic. I'm excited um, with the uh, 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 R&D ecosystem that a lot of people in this, in this community have created. You know, we're looking forward to more pre-competitive partnerships with our um, industrial partners, right, in pharma especially. Um, definitely continue capacity building efforts. We've got a huge, uh, uh, exciting opportunity with our biodiversity and our, uh, 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 our first Philippines-based API manufacturing hopefully will come from that. Um, balance also regulation with patient access, like I said, you know, with, in the previous slide, and it's kind of where, especially if we're trying to grow our locally sourced products. So these are our partnerships. Um, we're looking for more partners. You know, I want to thank uh, PCHRD, USAID Stride, and Picari, um, Carlitos Lab at UC Davis, um, the different collaborators that we have at, from the University of the Philippines, Beth Lajos and Rev Juanico from TIP, our, our Ateneo de Manila partners who are trying to help us with the herbal supply chain our industrial partner, UrbanX, and Lung Center of the Philippines for, for helping us develop the bioassays. Thanks for listening. Um, and we go back to you, Al. Al, are you back? Yeah, I'm back. Thank you very much, Gani. Again, uh, actually, Gani is one of those people who doesn't need an introduction because of his family name. <laughs> but, <laughs> thank you very much for outlining exactly how a big pharma company like Pascual, local company, uh, uh, started collaborations way back and again I'm so proud to see your collaborations increasing from our original Ateneo days on uh, growing and looking at moisture content of the harvest of the farmers yes, yes. to now almost uh, doing actual science and chemistry and analytical capability with Carlito but it does take time clearly to me I've been back here for seven years after having been an entrepreneur for 17 and I'm patient but Sometimes it's really slow. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I hope that uh, you guys out there in the audience see what it takes for a company to license your technology. I mean, uh, Gani has had put, put out a nice outline in terms of revenue streams, development times, and licensing fees, which we will tackle in the next round of speakers. But 